I alluded to this this morning, but the subject matter for what I'm going to be teaching on this evening is pride. It's subject matter of pride, and it's pretty much going to be a, a real basic summary overview of pride and how the Bible deals with pride. But I think this is probably one of the worst sins to get caught up in just because it leads to so much more. This is kind of a foundational problem. That's a spiritual foundational problem that both saved and unsaved people can fall into. And it's this issue of pride. And when we see the extent and the extreme of pride and where pride can take you, it can take you to the worst places. You know, especially for the unsaved. We see the, the Romans 1 type people. It starts off with pride. And we're going to see that later. I'm going to get into that a lot more. We're going to dig into that more later on in the sermon. But that's just to show you how far pride can take somebody. Pride is the number one reason why people don't get saved. That is the number one reason. Well, first of all, before we get further than that, what is pride? Pride is just being someone who's lifted up. I think everyone knows what pr pride is or being proud, a proud person. Some synonyms would be maybe someone who's conceited, someone who is full of themselves, someone who is puffed up. We'll see that in the Bible, or they're lifted up, and they kind of, well, the reason they use that puffed or lifted is because they kind of feel like they're above everybody else. And oftentimes you'll see uh, pro, like, um, parables or teachings in Scripture, and they'll talk about great trees, right? And these trees that go up to heaven, and they're above all the other trees. And that's another symbolic reference of, of talking about pride and, and showing how people in kings and certain people could become real lifted up with pride, and they feel like they're better than everybody else. They're above everyone else. The reason why people... Uh, proud people don't get saved is because they don't think they need anything from anybody, that they're good enough to handle everything on their own. And in order to get saved, what do we need? We need to be humble. We need to be able to receive a free gift. You need to be able to accept that there's something that you have no control over as far as being able to do on your own. You have to be able to accept that you getting to heaven, that you being a good person or getting to a good place, not being a good person, but be, getting to a good place after you die, is ultimately going to have nothing to do with how much you work and how good you are. And the proud person cannot let go of that. The proud person has to say, no, I'm doing it. I'm working for it. It has to do with me. And that's the number one reason why people don't even get saved. And when we see here, the, the title of my sermon, Pride Goeth Before Destruction, we get that from Proverbs 16 that we just read here. Look down at verse number five. The Bible says, Everyone, actually this isn't where the, the title comes from, but uh, verse number 18, the Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. And inevitably, again, saved or unsaved, doesn't matter. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. You start getting full of yourself. You start getting lifted up in pride. Watch out because your fall is going to come. And this is something that God abhors. God hates pride. If you think about it, who is it that is exalted? God is, right? The Lord is high. He's the Almighty. He's the one that ought to be lifted up. He's the one that's worthy of worship, worthy of praise. He's the one that ought to be exalted and put up on high. So at whatever point we start lifting ourselves up to try to get even closer to like being exalted, we think even in our own minds, even though it's not real, but just in our own minds, we're thinking we should be lifted up. God hates that. He's saying, no, you are lowly. You are my creation. And then on top of that, not just being God's creation, you're sinners. You're not all that in a bag of chips. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm using some phrases back from, you know, some people will be looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? What did Pastor Burson say today? You're not, you, you're not as good as you think you are. And people get so full of themselves and get so conceited and get these big heads thinking that they're so great. And God actually hates that. Look at verse number five here in Proverbs 16. The Bible says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, 
Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. That word abomination, by the way, is not thrown around loosely in Scripture. You can do a word study on things that are, are abominable or that God thinks are an abomination. And you're going to find some of the worst of the worst things that are referred to as being abominable. That ought to tell you something when the Bible's using abomination to describe pride. It is hated extremely by God for people to be proud, to have a proud heart, to be lifted up in himself. Proverbs 6.16, you have to turn there. Turn if you would to Proverbs 8. Proverbs 6.16 says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. It lists off these abominations. And guess what number one is? The number one thing listed, a proud look. God hates, it's an abomination for you to have a proud look, for you to be lifted up in pride. Proverbs 8.13, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. God hates proud. He hates people who are arrogant, full of themselves. We as Christians need to watch out for this. It is easy to get caught up into being lifted up with pride. Sarah, sit down in your seat right now. It is very easy to get caught up in this, especially if you are being successful in any areas of your life. When things are not going wrong, when things aren't going bad, when you don't have struggles, when you don't have problems, and things start to go well, this is the time when you have to be on the most lookout for developing a big head because that's the way it's happened all throughout history and that's the way human, the sinful human nature works is that you start looking around and thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. Hey, I did all this stuff. We have a perfect example with Nebuchadnezzar. You read the book of Daniel and you see the story of Nebuchadnezzar and he, and He's someone who God used, who God very clearly and evidently in Scripture lifted him up to be a king of kings in this earth, to rule over a worldly kingdom. God used him to bring judgment upon many wicked nations. Now, he wasn't a godly person. Babylon wasn't a godly nation. But it's just someone that God was using. But see, God put him in that position. God's the one who elevated him to that status. But what did it do? It went to his head. To the point where he's thinking, look at, look at my great kingdom. Look at all the works of my hand. Look what I have done. I am so great to where basically he's allowing, you know, you have statues built to him or whatever. People worshiping him. And it doesn't matter because he thinks I'm that great. And people start, you know, he starts to get that uh, of himself, that thought of himself. But what God did, he had to bring him low. He made him act like an animal and lost his mind for seven years. He was literally eating grass of the field and was out in the elements. Like this is, this is a real story. This isn't just some parable. Like this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he couldn't even rule the kingdom or anything anymore because he just went nuts. He went off the deep end and they're just like, wow. There's, and, and you know what that did to him? It brought him low real fast. To the point to where there's an entire chapter in the book of Daniel of him just saying, God brought me really low. He's the one who lifted me up and he's the one who brought me down. The Lord is God. And, you know, and, and he just recognized and, and just said, yep, he's the one. If there's power in this earth, he's the one that did it and giving God all the credit and all the glory and all the honor. But see, he had to be brought low. God hated that. God hates to see that. People getting lifted up and getting full of themselves, full of pride. Pride brings shame. Turn to Proverbs 11. We're going to go through most of the references to pride in Proverbs because there's different aspects and different problems that come along with pride, and we're going to see all these things. The number one thing we started with, pride goeth before destruction. You want to be destroyed, you want to be brought down, just let yourself get lifted up with pride and, and it'll take care of itself. But there's many other things along the way that come with pride. 
Proverbs 11, verse 2, the Bible reads, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. When people get lifted up and full of themselves, they start doing things that bring shame under their name, that cause them to be shameful. Pride brings fights. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs verse number or chapter number 13. Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. Contention's fighting. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Turn to Proverbs 16. I'll read Proverbs 28, 25 for you. It says, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. They're not able to let things go. They're going to cause problems with people. Why? Because you think that you're so smart and you think that you're so good and you're going to go around and tell everyone else why you're right and they're wrong. That's what pride does. It brings strife. It brings contention. It stirs up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Proverbs 16, pride brings destruction. And this is where we started. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Proverbs 18, verse 12, basically says the same thing. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but honor but, and before honor is humility. So you have two choices. You can either be proud or you can be humble. You can either receive destruction or honor. See, God's going to lift up and exalt those that abase or lower themselves, that, that will humble themselves, bring themselves down, allow other people to be exalted, other people to be lifted up. Then in the end, God exalts that person. I mean, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of this, of how we ought to be, the humility that we ought to have. The humility of, of the, the everlasting God. Jesus Christ becoming a man, a human being, and just taking on the form of a baby, of a child that needs to be physically dependent on people, on his mom, to feed him and to provide for him and to protect him and to clothe him and to do all these things for him. This is a God that's in heaven coming down to earth to, to be, un, be exposed to all, all of the, the, you know, the frailties, as it were, of a, of a human body in the flesh. And taking that on himself and then working and suffering and, and the ridicule and the shame brought on him from other people and all that he endured and all the work and all the, just everything that he did for us demonstrates the humility that we need to have. Because if anybody is exalted, it's Jesus Christ himself. And if there's anyone who would be worthy of having a lifted up head or air about him, we couldn't even call him proud. That would just be Jesus being powerful and almighty and being God. There would be nothing wrong with that. But see, he took on, even being the most high, took on the form of a human being to, to give us that example, to show us the, the humility that we ought to have. And that if Jesus Christ, if God himself is able to do this, then I think we better take a double take on on you know, check our pride, especially when, I mean, think about when someone does you wrong. I mean, my wife was just telling me today in the car about someone just cutting her off. I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time out here. You know, or people trying to swerve around you doing all this stuff, right? Well, I get it when people are in the wrong, but we need to just be careful. We could maintain a humble spirit. Because getting angry and getting all upset and getting offended at someone who does you wrong ultimately is not going to do you any good. Now, I know it's a natural response, and I'm not saying, any, I'm, not saying I'm perfect with this. I'm not saying I always do good. But we have to check this and, and check ourselves because if we allow that to grow, if we allow this, this you know, anger and irritation because, oh, they disrespected me. They did this. They did that. You know, I can't believe you. You know, people are getting shot these days. Because they feel disrespected by, by someone doing something in traffic. Or someone stepping on your toes. Or someone looking at you the wrong way when you walk by someone on the street. Oh, you disrespected me. Whatever. 
That's a proud look. That's a proud attitude. That's a proud heart. That's not the way Jesus was. When he, did you think he was out there causing fights and trouble to people? Don't you know who I am? We don't see that recorded in the Bible ever one time. Just, just, just Jesus talking to someone like, you know who you're messing with? The only time we see anything close to that is when he said, you know what? You could have no power at all except that we're given to you by my Father in heaven. He says, I could have, you know, legions of angels here if I wanted to. But he didn't threaten with that. He was just saying who he was. And he, he wasn't even coming across with, this, with a bad attitude or a proud heart. He was actually just giving rebuke to someone who was very lifted up and thought he was so high and almighty and that, don't you know that, that I can set you free? I have the power to set you free. I can release you or I can condemn you. Don't you know that? <laughs> this is like, yeah, no. <laughs> Actually, no. The, the power is given to you by someone higher than you. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that and Herod had to learn that also, apparently. Just the nature of being proud is a self-destructive nature where people think that they're better than anyone else. It's only going to cause problems. The Bible says in Proverbs, turn if you would to Job 41. Job 41. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Pride will bring you low. It always will, especially people who think more highly of themselves than they ought to because it's just in their head anyways. People who are lifted up in pride, they're not really exalted. It's just in their head. <laughs> so even just bringing them back to reality is going to bring them way low. Just getting a dose of reality. And everyone's going to get a dose of reality. And all the proud people, they're going to get a dose of reality when every knee shall bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is going to be a dose of serious reality. They're going to realize that this isn't just make-believe. This isn't just some imaginary God. You know, people who are so proud and lifted up and full of themselves. It's reality. And that they're not as big and powerful and awesome as they think they are. Job 41. We're going to see this, this uh, passage. is about Leviathan. Leviathan, I believe, is a real beast. Is a real beast that existed or potentially could still exist today. But more importantly than being a real beast, it's representative of Satan, of the dragon, of the devil. I do believe that Behemoth and Leviathan are real creatures. I believe, yes, I believe in fire-breathing dragons. If they're not around anymore today, I believe they definitely existed in the past. So the Bible doesn't talk about make-believe creatures like that. I believe it's real. It's not that far-fetched either. I mean, you believe, you believe Scripture, first of all. That's not far-fetched. But number two, okay, a serpent that has wings. I mean, we see so many things that are already real close to that and talk about scales and all this other stuff. So whatever, I'm not going to get off into that tangent. But let's read this attribute here of Leviathan, verse number 15 of Job 41. The Bible says, His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. So what this is describing is the scales that this beast has, that, that it's like it's defense, it's armor, that they're, they're, they're so close together that the, it's impenetrable, right? It's just describing this awesome defense mechanism. And if you think about being indefensible or in, you know, impenetrable, how that can go to your head. There's many reasons that get people caught up into pride. In this case, with Leviathan, it's just, hey, nobody can hurt me. I'm untouchable. And you can start building off of that. I can do whatever I want. What are you going to do to me? Nothing. I've got this great defense. No one's going to kill me. No one's going to stop me. I can do whatever I want. I can be full of myself and just continue to get worse and worse from there. But this is just one example. There's many reasons why people get lifted up in themselves. Think about how many people might have been blessed with some talent of God 
whether it be through musical ability or just some other talent that you have and people like that and then they want to see or hear or you know, see you do what you're doing and you start to think, wow, look at all these people. It turns into worship. And then it just feeds off itself and people get more and more full of pride. You look at the rock stars. The reason why they get full of pride, one of the reasons is because, you know, maybe they start off just doing something they like. They just play, you know, they love worldly music. They like playing their music, whatever. But then they start playing their music and they get up on a stage. Right? And now, physically, they're lifted up already because they're on a stage. And they start seeing all these people all focused on them. And they're, you know, and you know what? It's not as much about the music anymore as they like seeing all these crowds of people. Oh, putting their hands up and yeah, you know. It becomes very powerful. And look, I've been to plenty of rock concerts and concerts in my life, and they start doing things, and they'll get crowds going, and, and they wield a lot of power. And, I mean, you see people wearing T-shirts with, like, your face on it, walking around, and they're all buying your stuff, and, and that lifts people up. It lifts them up really high. And don't think that it's just the rock stars that are standing up on platforms that love the crowds coming and gathering around and talking about how great they are. Pride is the number one attribute of the Pharisee also. That love to wear the long garments. And they love the greetings and the salutations in the uppermost rooms at feasts. They loved being exalted by men. They were very proud. And I'll tell you what, we're speaking of a lot of different examples of unsaved people or of reprobates or whatever. Believers need to watch out for this too. Even good men of God need to watch out for this. Watch out for the fame that could go around just because someone, hey, you could start off really good and you've got a solid message and you're true to everything, everybody needs to watch out. Take heed lest you fall. The best, most greatest man of God needs to watch out for this and probably watch out for it even more. The more popularity there is, the more there's things going on around you, you need to watch out for that. And thank God, I don't think anyone that I know has succumbed to, to having you know, a big head or a proud heart. But it is definitely a concern. It just needs to be watched out for. It is it, because what's going to end up happening is people get destroyed. There have been plenty of men of God in the past who have let themselves get lifted up in pride. And what happens? They end up thinking they're entitled to more than they really are. And what you'll end up finding is they end up sinning either by stealing. And it's always going to have something to do with some type of covetousness, right? Because the pride lifts you up into thinking that you can have things that you really can't have. So they're going to end up uncovering something. Either you're stealing or you're having some type of, of, of relationship with someone you ought not to have a relationship with. Those are the types of things you're going to find when people get lifted up in this, in this type of an era, especially among, you know, saved people. That's what's going to happen. And you know what happens? Destruction. Church, entire churches get destroyed. Entire great soul winning, people doing great work for God get destroyed. Because Satan likes to feed the pride of man. And if you're not careful and not watching out for it, it will destroy it could destroy anybody. Anyone is susceptible to this. In Job 41, let's look, jump down to verse number 33. The Bible says, Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all, all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Leviathan is, is symbolic of Satan here. Satan is the king over all the children of pride. And just keep that in mind when you, when you start to get lifted up. Hey, Satan's the king of all the children of pride. 
Now you're following your father, the devil. Turn if you would to Psalm 10. Psalm chapter 10. We're going to see some characteristics of the proud, wicked man. Psalm 10. Verse number 2, the Bible reads, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. And that's not a surprise, because if someone thinks that they're better than everyone else, who's going to be the lowest people that they're not even going to care about at all? It's going to be the poor people. Of course. I mean, this is, this is a mindset that proud people have. They don't, they don't even consider, oftentimes you get the, the most proud people in the world they don't even view poor people as being human. That's why they don't care. You know, there's a lot of proud people in government. And, you know, you hear all this stuff about, oh, this is going to help the poor. No, it's not. The, gov the programs that the government puts out never are going to help the poor. They're going to make them more dependent and it's going to turn them more into slaves than anything else. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. That's why you see these wicked people that are full of pride. They lift up each other. They look at other wicked people, other covetous people, other proud people, and they lift them up. And God hates them too. God hates the, the, the proud. Verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. We have an extremely proud person today in the White House in the United States of America. Probably one of the most proud people I've ever seen or heard on like public airwaves. And I still see this stuff on social media. Oh, you know, as, as if it's some minor detail. They'll say, oh, but he's doing this with the economy and he's doing this here and I can't believe you gotta love him, you gotta vote for him. Oh, I know you say that he's proud or whatever. As if this is like a minor thing. Okay, this is one of the reasons why I'm going in depth into pride tonight. Because I think a lot of people don't realize how extremely just, just what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not destructive, but just how uh, How much pride can just, I mean, it's destructive, but it's not the word I'm thinking of. How fundamental, how fundamentally wrong and how fundamentally bad pride is. With, I mean, for that to be someone's characteristic, the Bible says that the, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's going to bring you in all you people who are, who are full of pride are also going to be very covetous and greedy. And that's going to lead you in all... It's, it's like the... It will bring every aspect of your life down, being proud. It may make a person somewhat successful financially, potentially, in this world. Especially, you know, when they're, when they're able to not care about who they hurt. Because they're just caring about themselves and making money. but they will be brought low. And we see here this wicked through the pride of his countenance says they're not going to seek after God. So people who want to claim, oh, Trump, he's a godsend. God gave us his present. As if it's like a good thing, like God's giving us this great guy to do all these good things for us. No, God is not in all his thoughts. Are you kidding me? Of course he's not. Listen to the guy. God is not in all his thoughts. I don't think God's in any of his thoughts, let alone all of his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments, how about God's judgments, are far above out of his sight. Like, 
no concept of the judgment of God. And he had said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. It's a very dangerous person to be put into power that has such a, a wicked, proud heart. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 16. Now we're going to cover, we're going to shift gears a little bit, but it's still, it still is very pertinent with pride. And I want to deal with this. I meant to deal with this when I preached on the Atlanta Pride Parade, but the sermon kind of didn't take its, it didn't, it didn't turn that way. It was coming out a little bit different than I was originally intending, so, which is fine. We'll cover it tonight. Ezekiel chapter 16, because this is also a place that people want to turn to, to kind of downplay sodomy and downplay Oh, well, you don't, do you know why God really destroyed Sodom? It's not because they were a bunch of filthy, faggot perverts. It's because they were proud. You know that? That's what they'll say. So we're going to read this passage, and we're going to see where that comes from, even that thought. Now, that is the root of their problem. They ended up becoming these, these, these just reprobate perverts, that needed to just be destroyed because there was no saving and no salvation for them at all. They just needed to be completely wiped out. But that root came from pride. And it, it is. It, it comes from pride. And that's why we're, I'm so concerned about, you know, people thinking pride's not that big of a deal. Because it really is that big of a deal because it could lead to the worst of everything. Romans 1 says that the, the um, you know, the, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, became vain in their imagination, right? And their, their, um, their filthy, and their heart was darkened. And now the passage that I've gone over so many times, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Right? So they're lifting themselves up saying, oh, we're so smart. We know so. Oh, that, we, we know God, but we're not, that's not really God. We're going to make up our own. They've, ex, they've created their idols and they've lifted up themselves. Pride is an attribute, by the way, later in Romans 1 as well. And of course, pride is the number one. When you hear, oh, it's Pride Week. When you hear anything about pride these days, what does it have to do with? The reprobate, the sodomite. Why? Because the two go hand in hand. When we read about pride in the Bible, guess what? It's never a positive thing, ever. Funny how that's always associated with a sodomite, though. Hmm. Something the Bible says is never a good thing. Always with the wicked. But let's look at Ezekiel chapter 16. Look at verse number 48. The Bible says, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. So they say, see, there it is. It wasn't because they were homos. It's just because they were proud. But let's read this in context and understand what he's saying. Because that was the root cause, was pride. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in, her, was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty. Haughty is another word for being proud. And committed abomination before me. So they were haughty and they committed abomination. Now what do you think the abomination that they committed is? They committed abomination. Men were lying with men and women with women. That's an abomination unto the Lord. That's what they were committing. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So why did God rain down fire and brimstone? It wasn't just because they were proud. It's because they committed abomination before him. And they said, that's it. This is sick. This is twisted. This is perverted. You're beyond hope. You're done. Now, Verse 49 still stands, 
Their, pride, their, their sin was pride. It was fullness of bread. They became rich. They were, lived in the well-watered plain. They had everything they could desire, everything they could want. They ended up having a bunch of extra time, and they were, got full of themselves. They had abundance of idleness, just a bunch of free time to just go off and just do whatever. And that led them down this path of becoming perverts. It's no surprise when you see the really famous people who end up having abundance of riches. They're full of themselves. They're proud. They've got everything they could want. They can go and do. And they have a bunch of idleness because they have all this free time, because they have all this money. And all they have to do is, they, you know, they, they, they play their music or do their, their, their work for, the, for creating movies or whatever, but then they end up having this abundance of time and idleness and money, and they're proud and they're full of themselves. That's why you, so many of them are just sodomites. That's what happened in Sodom. It's a warning. Beware of that. Turn to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue will we prevail, and our lips our own. Who is Lord over us? It's that proud attitude, that proud heart that speaks of proud things. Thank you. That God is going to cut off. And he says... Um, Yeah, God's going to cut off. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Wasn't sure if I'd have enough time to go over this, but we do have enough time to go over this. Because this is also kind of an important aspect that I think oftentimes might get missed. It has to do with pride and alcohol and being a drunkard. And I know I preached a lot of sermons against drinking alcohol, against being a drunkard, against all these types of things, but I don't think I've ever really touched on the aspect of pride. Alcohol does a, a, a few things to people. One of the things it does is, is it Obviously, you know, everything the Bible says is true. Your eyes are going to behold strange women. Your heart's going to utter perverse things. You know, all these different effects are going to happen. But another thing that happens is people tend to get more proud when they get drunk. There's a lot more fights that happen. That's why they're called bar fights that happen in bars than they happen at other, than like, say, at a movie theater. Right? At a movie theater, you're going to have a bunch of people congregated together. Right? You can have crowds of people sometimes, and you have to like, walk through a crowd and get past people at an amusement park or something like that where you have a lot of people around. And you might accidentally step on somebody's toes, or you might bump into someone just because there's a lot of people around. But you're not seeing the fist fights flying at, you know, where, at, at any of these places other than at the bars. You know what you do see at the bars? You go to the bathroom in a bar, there's a crowded place, and you accidentally, like, you stumble, you trip because you're drunk, right? And you actually bump into someone else. You know what? Oftentimes, that's enough just to go, someone, that guy just to, oh, you hit, you know, you hit me? Why? Because they're drunk, and that's even escalated their pride. It is a very key attribute. Watch out for that, because, again, this is... <laughs> Alcohol can turn people into very proud people. But then it's also, think about how many people, and I, I used to be one of them. Again, I, I'm guilty of this. I, I'm, not, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'll admit it freely. The pride that goes into, 
Oh, well, how much can you drink? Oh, pff, 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 he only got drunk after drinking two beers. Pff, I could put out a case before I feel anything. Oh, I could, you know, and it just turns into this big, proud session of, well, how much poison can you ingest before you're going to fall over and vomit and, and wet yourself? Big, tough guy. But we're, we're going to see the connection. The Bible has this connection already. I mean, we know it exists. You can see it happen in real life, but the Bible already warns about this, so you don't ever have to f figure it out through experience. Verse number four of Habakkuk 2, the Bible reads, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. The person who has a lot of pride, they're not upright in heart. But the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. I was saying, because he's a drunkard, because he's transgressing and drinking wine, he's a proud man. Neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long, and to him that ladeth himself, with thick clay. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. But in Isaiah 28, verse number 1, the Bible says, Woe to the crown of pride. So you think about pride being personified and wearing a crown. What is that crown that's on top of the head of pride? It says, To the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. The drunkard. The alcohol is the crown of pride. Drunkenness. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to switch gears again off the alcohol, but I just, I, I wanted to make sure that that got brought up because some people tend to have a tendency to think that drinking, drinking a little bit of booze isn't that bad. It's not a big deal. First of all, yes, it is. But second of all, when you realize how bad pride is and then how pride is tied in with wine, specifically, it's not tied in with other sins necessarily, but with the transgressing by wine, yes, it is. It's tied in with that. And being a drunkard, being drunken. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 5, the Bible reads, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. This is the spirit that we ought to have, being humble, looking to other people, submitting yourselves unto one another. Uh, it says, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So you want God resisting you and what you're doing and every step of your way? Be proud. Be full of yourself. That's a sure way to get God against you, to be at enmity with God. Verse number six, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, I brought up the humility of Jesus Christ, but through all of that humility, Jesus Christ receives the most exaltation above every name that's ever been named, above every name in heaven and on earth, the name of Jesus Christ, because he had the most humility going through everything he went through. So, of course, he's going to receive that exaltation. And we need to remember, and it's one way to keep you humble, is to just remember every slight, every infraction, every time you're done wrong, and it's not your fault, and someone just does things against you, and you maintain the right godly spirit and the right attitude, God will lift you up. It's okay to have your name drug through the mud and have people lie about you and slander you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for his sake, for the name of Jesus' sake. Because the Bible says that you can jump for joy in that day because great is your reward in heaven. Because there is a day where God will exalt you and lift up and magnify your name for allowing the things that happen here without getting full of pride and just being humble about it and just say, well, I'm a servant of the Lord, and that's, that's all I can expect. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of, him, of his household? That's a humble attitude to have. Say, who am I? 
If they did that to the most important person ever, then who am I? Okay, I don't, I don't expect anything better. Verse number seven, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Turn to 1 Timothy 6. We're kind of going to close on this, this one general main point just regarding pride. Just regarding pride as believers and getting caught up even in doing godly things and the danger and where we need to watch out for, for having too much pride. There's a warning given about someone, first of all, becoming a pastor. There's a lot of qualifications for someone to become an elder or bishop in Scripture. And one of those qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 is not a novice. So a novice is just someone who's a beginner, someone who's just kind of getting started. Maybe they're, they're a novice because they just got saved or a novice because they just don't have a lot of knowledge, right? Um, but that is not someone to be put in a position of being the teacher, of being the person who's going to be receiving the attention, the person who's going to be having some level of power among other people. You don't want that person, that beginner, to be put in that position because the Bible says, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. How are you going to supply advice and counsel and help and, and you know, all the jobs that a pastor should have over a flock if you're just a beginner yourself? Now, you might be, you know, have the right spirit or the right attitude at first. Oh, man, I want to do as much as I can. I want to serve. I want to pastor you. I want to do all these things. But we don't want to put a novice in that position because they could be lifted up with pride through all of the, you know, the interactions or the people looking to or whatever that comes along with being a pastor. And, and that that can go to their head and to be lifted up with pride. And we also need to be careful and say, maybe I don't ever plan on being a pastor. Maybe I understand that point. But the more that you learn in general from the Scripture, from the Bible, the more that you learn it's going to be an opportunity for you to start getting a big head because you think that you know so much. You think that you're so smart. I've met some of the proudest people out soul winning that weren't going to any church because they said they know more than all, the, all these pastors. They don't know nothing. They don't, you know, I know so much more than all these other guys. You know what that says? I am just full of myself and I think very highly of myself and very lowly of everybody else. They don't care the amount of work, the amount of hours, anything else that went into it. They're just, you're stupid and I'm smart. And everyone needs to watch out for that attitude. Because you may think that you know, you might actually know something that a lot of people don't know or at least don't believe. You may be right on an area that other people are wrong on. But just because you're right about something doesn't make you smarter or better, say, than a fellow brother in Christ. And this is, this is an attitude I've seen, and I, I don't know if I've seen it a lot lately, but I, I'd seen it creeping up years ago, and, and maybe it's, it probably is still there. I just don't, I'm just not on the social media and stuff anymore. I don't really see as much of what's going on, but this, this attitude of, uh, and, and it, it really bothers me when you've got someone, you know, if you're, if you're talking about someone who's a false prophet, they're not saved, they're some, you know, whatever. That doesn't bother me nearly as much as someone who, someone who's a soul winner, someone who's a good guy, someone who's on our team, but they're pre-trib, they're Zionist, whatever, right? But they've been at it for 20 years, 30 years. They're still serving God. They're still doing a good work. And then you get someone who gets saved six months ago talking all kinds of trash and smack about this pastor who's been passing for 20 or 30 years or whatever. And they're just saying, oh, he's an idiot. He's stupid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. No, it's like, 
Oh, hold on a second there, buddy. Yeah, you may be right about this issue or whatever, but be careful who you go around and just, and just you know, lifting yourself up, thinking that you're so smart, because what do you have that you didn't receive from someone else? And the, the Bible gave the examples in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. I don't have this in my notes, but I know that's where it is. 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 2. Because they were starting to lift up one over another. They were talking about Paul or Cephas or Christ. You know, like, like oh, I'm this apostle, I'm that. I'm, I follow this person, I follow that person. And he's saying, you know, well, how do you even, you know, you, didn't, you don't have anything but what you already received. What was it, 1 Corinthians 2? Yeah, that's, that's where it is. 1 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians. Well, anyways, if someone wants to find that for me, I'll, I'll read it. But if you're in 1 Corinthians, you could also flip to chapter number 8. The Bible says in verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge has the ability to puff people up and for you to get proud. You could study and read the Bible and read the Scripture and just and, and know a lot and gain a lot of knowledge. And that can lift up your mind and your attitude into thinking that, hey, I know so much more. You know, these people are talking. Because, let's face it, if you, if you do know a lot and people come to you without knowledge, people who are ignorant, the temptation is there to start feeling like you're so much better than everyone else. Do you have the passage for me? 4-7. We'll get back to, to my point here because I wanted to read that. For, yeah. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? That's exactly the verse. Thank you, Brother Carter, that I was looking for. He's saying... What makes you so different than another? But this ties in perfectly with what I'm saying here. Because everything that you know, you have received from someone else. You've received it. And what he's saying is, there, okay, maybe you've received a lot. Maybe you've received more than someone else, but that is no reason for you to glory and be lifted up and proud over how much you've received over someone else because it's not like you just came up with everything on your own either. I mean, it's different than you actually coming up and coming up with everything on your own because then you would have actually done and created it. You say, yeah, but I did come up with this belief on my own. Any belief that you came up with on your own, it still wasn't on your own because the Holy Ghost revealed that unto you. Whether you received it from a pastor, from a preacher, from another person, another church member. If you didn't receive it from anybody like that, but you were just reading the Bible, you still didn't just get that on your own. God revealed it unto you. This is a spiritual book and it's spiritually discerned and you need to have the Holy Spirit to understand it. And it's the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth. So whatever it is that you have or you think you have or that you know so much more than everyone else, it still isn't your own. It's, it was given to you. So if something's given to you for a free grift, where do you get off thinking that you can be so proud and high and mighty over anyone else? It would be as silly and as stupid as me thinking I'm so much better than someone else because I got this free gift from God of salvation. I'm saved, so I'm so much better than you. That's ridiculous and stupid. Of course I'm not better than someone else. I'm a sinner like anyone else. I just received a free gift. And the humble thing to do is, hey, let's tell everyone else about this free gift. Let's not try to hoard it for ourselves. Let's say, hey, we could all have this free gift. Do the same thing with knowledge. You don't talk down to people because they don't know something that you know and make them feel like an idiot and just make them feel stupid. Explain it to them. Share that with them. 
And don't talk down to people. Someone, so if someone's looking to be a pastor or a teacher, you need to be apt to teach. And one way that you're apt, you have an aptitude to teach, is to not making people feel like they're a big dummy when you're trying to explain something to them. Because no one's going to want to listen to someone like that. I had someone like that in, my, in college in one of my uh, math courses. It's a horrible teacher. And all he kept saying is, I don't know why you can't, you guys don't understand this. This is just super simple. Like the whole class was just like, what did you just do? We don't understand. You're not explaining it very well. And he says, well, this is just real simple. I don't know why you guys can't get this. Not apt to teach. <laughs> it could be simple for him, but it wasn't for everyone else. We need to be careful that we don't get full of ourselves. We don't get proud. Here's the way I was trying to explain it before. Pride is like a cancer. You need to stamp it out quickly before it spreads to all areas of your life and just becomes toxic. That was the other word I was looking for, toxic. Pride is toxic. It's something that's worse than, you know, the Bible says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Pride is one of those sins. You allow yourself to start getting lifted up with pride. It is going to, it's going to take you into just all manner of sin. Because it's one of those sins, when you start thinking highly of yourself, you're going to start thinking you can do whatever you want. Because you're better than everyone else. Or you're special. Well, I deserve this. Watch out for the proud heart. It, it always, always goes before destruction. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. I pray that you would please help us all to remain humble. And um, God, we just want you to use us. We want to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, not our own names, not the name of our church, not the name of our pastor, not the name of ourselves, but we want to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, dear Lord, because that is the name that deserves exaltation. God, I pray that you would please help us in this endeavor that we wouldn't get sucked into the trap of thinking that we're someone extra special because of how much money we make or because of what things have been given to us or, or wh whatever our status is in this life, dear Lord, but that we can just continue to roll up our sleeves and serve you on a daily basis with humility. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.